Great. Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Armchair Adventure Book Club, May 21st. We're super excited this week to discuss Grandma Gatewood's Walk with the author, Ben Montgomery. Uh, if you're not familiar with Grandma Gatewood, we'll talk a lot about her today, but she's certainly one of my heroes, the first female hiker to complete the Appalachian Trail by herself. She was also the first person to do it two times. Um, and she started her journey in her late 60s is when she found the trail. So she's known for a lot. She's a pioneer in many ways. And today we have one of, one of the folks who knows more about Grandma Gatewood than almost anyone else out there, except maybe um, her remaining children and, and grandchildren. But uh, it's an honor to welcome Ben. Ben, hey, thanks for Hello. joining us. Hey, glad to be here. So my first question for you is just how did your um, sort of infatuation, infatuation, that might be strong, but how did your curiosity get started with Grandma Gatewood and how did you first hear about her? When did the idea for the book came up? come up? How did this journey get going for you? Yeah, so uh, I was a newspaper reporter at the Tampa Bay Times, uh, gosh, going back to 2000. 11, 2012, and I wrote a story that got, um, sort of went viral, it got a lot of attention, and wound up in the hands of a literary agent in uh, New York, uh, Jane Distel, who, I can't remember if she called me or emailed me, but she said, I like your style, and do you have any um, book ideas? And this is like every writer's dream, you know, you want somebody to reach out like that, and, uh, and so, uh, and at the time I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about, I mean, I always sort of envisioned writing a book, but I wasn't, um, it wasn't a part of, you know, uh, my immediate future. Uh, so I, I just did what I always do. I, I started thinking about stories that I've written and that I know and trying to figure out if any of them had the potential to be a book. And I remembered um, my mother telling me when I was growing up, uh, as a kid, telling me stories about this distant relative of ours. Uh, it was my mother's great aunt, um, whose name was Emma Gatewood, and that she had been the first woman to hike the entirety of the Appalachian Trail, and she had lived kind of a, a remarkable life. Uh, and that, that's sort of all I knew at that time. And so I started poking around. I realized nobody had ever written a biography of Emma Gatewood. Um, and uh, and I, I through you know, family connections, I realized that a couple of her, well, four of her children were still alive, four of her 11 children were still alive. So I thought there's a chance for me to, um, you know, to do this justice before it's too late. And so, uh, so very quickly I learned that, uh, you know, not only had she been the first woman to through hike the AT, She'd also done it twice, been the first person to ever do the entire trail twice and first person to ever do the entire trail three times. And then she had also, uh, in the middle of all that, done the Oregon Trail, hiked about 2,000 miles from Independence, Missouri to Portland, Oregon. Um, so my pitch to this agent, who at the time was a stranger to me, was, uh, you know, I want to write a story about a, uh, uh, you know, a senior citizen who uh, in 1955 became famous for being the first woman to throw out the Appalachian Trail and she became an ambassador for, uh, you know, for hiking, for walking. And um, she immediately wrote back and said, I love this idea uh, of the hiking granny, let's do it. Um, so I knew nothing about how to, how to, you know, how to pitch a book, how to do a book, but she held my hand and walked me through the, the whole process. And, um, you know, it was a cool experience. And now, uh, last time I asked her, uh, which was six months ago, the book had sold 150,000 copies, which is just crazy to me. Awesome. So people are finding this story all over the place. A woman just emailed overnight. She said, I, uh, I, I read your book in preparation for a through hike of the John Muir Trail. She, she said, I'm Japanese. I live in Hong Kong. I would love to interpret this book into Japanese, translate this book into Japanese. Um, so, you know, 
people are finding it all over the place, which is just wild. Yeah, I, I love it. It's such a powerful story. It's so well written. I had no clue that she was a distant relative of yours. I don't know if you mentioned that in the book or not, but I figured that she probably had still a large extended family because she was one of 15 children and then had 11 of her own and I think 23 grandchildren. And she was a great grandmother too right. when she hiked the Appalachian Trail. So right. um, so quite a family network. And I was wondering, because you seemed, I, I'm sure your research was so thorough because you seemed very familiar with not just Grandma Gatewood and her story and her accomplishments, but also the Appalachian Trail. And um, before we get back to Grandma Gatewood, I was just wondering, like, before this started, what was your familiarity with the Appalachian Trail? And had you done any of it? Because the way you write about it was as descriptive as anyone who had done the entire trail. So were you a backpacker before you began this journey? No, not at all. Thanks for saying that. This has been a completely uh, uh, life-changing experience in that regard. Um, I don't think I had done any of the AT uh, when I started work on this book. Um, I'm not sure I was super familiar with the AT even existing. Uh, so, uh, you know, so in the course of the year and a half or so that, that, that I reported on it, um, I spent a ton of time out there. And uh, interestingly, I learned very early on, I think in conversation with Lori Pottinger from the ATC, uh, that like 99% of the trail is different now than it was in 1955. It's just constantly being rerouted, as you know, and um, changing shape to um, avoid ecologically sensitive areas and to give the hikers better experience and things like that. And so, uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to me to like try to through hike in 99. Uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, uh, in 2011, 12, when I started working on this. Um, and so I wanted, but, but I knew that Emma had, had seen some important things because I had access to her diary. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanted to uh, sit myself in the spots that she sat. I wanted to try to get um, as much information as I could about the, the spots that were for sure that where, where she planted her feet. And so uh, this took me to like Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania, which a stretch of trail that's the same now as it was in 55. Um, I hired a guide in Maine to trace her route uh, from the Penobscot to uh, the summit of Mount Katahdin because I wanted to see exactly what she saw. And, so the guy was actually the park supervisor at Baxter State Park. And so he had a guide service on the side, uh, Paul Shanacondro. Um, and so Paul took her diaries and took me along the trek that Emma would have hiked in 55. So those things were, you know, well, I climbed, uh, climbed to the top of uh, Oglethorpe. I actually drove yeah. to the top of Oglethorpe because I wanted to see what she would have seen standing on the peak of Oglethorpe. And of course, now that's all private property but I just ignored the no trespassing signs and went on through. Um, but, uh, but, you know, now, I mean, since the book came out, I've hiked 400 miles of the AT, uh, the Southern stretch from Hot Springs, uh, North Carolina to Springer Mountain, and then all of the Shenandoahs from Rockfish Gap to um, Harper's Ferry with my kids. Um, and that has just been an incredible experience. And so they now have a love and appreciation of the trail uh, that I didn't grow up with. Um, and they, they are itching every day to get back, you know. That's awesome. So when you started going through your research, because when you hear, when you're a hiker and you hear of Grandma Gatewood, you hear of her accomplishments. Yeah. But the book is really twofold because you talk about everything she endured on trail, everything she accomplished on trail, but then everything she endured in a negative way off trail. Yeah. And her story is one of severe domestic abuse. And I was just wondering if that's something you knew about going into this in the beginning, or you started reading her journals or talking to her children and found out about, what was that discovery like for you? And then how did you feel it was your obligation or responsibility to represent that part of her life and her story in your book? Yeah, it's a great question. I 
didn't know anything about her domestic life um, when I first pitched the story to the agent. So that, you know, the abuse that she suffered for 30 years was, was not a part at all of the couple of paragraphs that I sent to the literary agent. Um, I first heard about that when I, uh, I met her youngest daughter, Lucy, who uh, fortunately lived in Jacksonville, Florida. Lucy's um, 92 now. Um, Lucy, uh, you know, was not bashful about telling me about things that her mother experienced. Um, it came out pretty organically and, and pretty early on in our conversation. And it was sort of like, everyone knows, you know, anybody who knows anything about the AT knows about Grandma Gatewood, but very few people know uh, about what it was like for her at home. And the fact was she got married at 18 to a 28 year old man and almost immediately he started abusing her and she bore him 11 children uh, plus two miscarriages um, and, uh, and was, the, was the victim of his anger and rage uh, over and over again. She finally left, she divorced him in 1941 um, when that was virtually unheard of uh, and it was because he had beaten her so badly that she thought, if he does this again, he's going to kill me. Uh, he had ripped part of her ear off. He had broken some ribs. He had cracked a few teeth. Um, and she had left, left home before that a couple of times. She had gone uh, on sort of a, not a vacation, but like a, a getaway to live with her family in California. Um, and she came back to him both times. Uh, and, then, and then this last fight occurred. It wasn't a fight. This last uh, uh, beating occurred. And she decided, this is it. I can't do this anymore. And so she filed for divorce and after 30 years of marriage and got away from him. And at that point, uh, all but two of her kids had, had, had grown up enough to, to be out of the house. So she had Louise and Lucy um, were the only two minors left, so to speak. And so uh, when, she, when she got away, uh, when she got divorced, um, she bought her own place and took the girls with her and got out of that terrible relationship. Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, back in 1940s, it, you know, it was so hard for a woman to file for divorce. And actually one of the, you know, hardest parts of the book to read is not just her going through all this domestic abuse, but in one case, in one of the latter um, arguments and fights she had, her husband, after abusing her, called the sheriff and he came and put Grandma Gatewood in jail right. <laughs> for being right. an abused woman. And, you know, I, I can't help but think that her bravery and, and finally leaving and filing for divorce, which was extremely difficult for women um, in that age, must have allowed her to see that there's there's opportunities that she is stronger than she thinks she is and that she can walk alone and and you know there's no necessarily proof or evidence but I feel like that was a huge step that led her to think well if I can do that then I can do this trail but I love to again when we remember someone we think about their accomplishments but Grandma Gatewood's first attempt at the Appalachian Trail was the total disaster right right like as a total right. failure can you tell us about that experience yeah 1954 um she uh made her way to mount katahdin and decided she was going to hike south um and let me pause real quick because I, I just want to address one point earlier when she would run from her husband she would go into the woods mm. and oftentimes she would wind up staying overnight uh until he calmed down um, and so the, 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 you know, the woods in southeastern Ohio around their farm was her getaway and her refuge. And she wrote poetry about this all the time. Um, so, so I feel like nature was, you know, a, get, getting alone in nature and, and, and hiking and walking and being by oneself and that kind of environment was uh, salve for her. It was her comfort and her therapy even during her marriage, before she attempted the high PAT. But in 1954, she made her way to Mount Katahdin and decided she was gonna travel south. 
and um, she made it within about 100 yards from Katahdin, close to uh, Rainbow Lake. And um, she got lost. Uh, the trail wasn't marked like it is today. Um, and so she somehow got deviated and got lost and spent a couple of days out there by herself, lost, uh, thinking that she was going to die. She ran out of food. She had seen a, um, a plane, a small a plane uh, fly overhead. She tried to wave it down, but had no luck. There was no evidence that the plane, that, that anybody saw her. And so um, she, uh, she broke her glasses as well. Um, she's getting bitten by black flies. She thinks, uh, all right, if I'm going to die, this is as good a place as any. And she lays down and um, sort of got a s burst of energy, uh, decided, all right, let me try to find the trail one more time. She gets up and she finds the trail and she makes her way back into uh, uh, the Rainbow Lake uh, camp area. And there's a, um, a ranger station there. And the rangers are playing horseshoes when she walks up and they they realize this is the person when she walks into camp they realize this is the person they've been looking for they've been flying rescue flights for and uh and they come up to her and they say you know this is no place the main woods are no place for a woman your age uh and they tell her go home grandma and so she um she does she uh finds her way back to um uh, bangor and um, or Millinock at first, and then Bangor, and uh, you know she looks at herself in the mirror, and she her eye is swollen from a black fly bite, and her glasses are broken, and she's a mess, and she thinks, I'm going to do this, <laughs> I'm going to do this again, I'm going to do it next year, and I'm going to show these guys that you know this can be done by a 60, 67 year old woman. So it, it was her her resolve to uh, attempt it again. And uh, I, I love that story. Yeah, I, I love it too. And, um, you know, so much of her story is unconventional, as is her approach in technology and gear on the Appalachian Trail. Um, you know, stories about her, people always say, oh, she, she hiked in Keds, you know, or some very thin-soled sneaker. She, yeah. instead of having a backpack, she had a knapsack that she slung over her shoulder. She carried a shower curtain to sleep under. Um, and instead of a sleeping bag, she would like warm rocks on a fire and sleep on those on the cold nights. But I think it's interesting because she re represents, um, it, you know, not just older hikers um, and what they can do, but certainly female hikers and what solo female hikers can do. And then she was also a pioneer in this ultralight gear and minimalism. Right. And I, I really feel like they're all connected because I think the idea of backpacking, especially back then, and, and you think of the first AT through hiker Earl Schaefer coming out of the military, right? So you think of these big packs and these military grade boots. And for a lot of older hikers and or females who are more petite, that's prohibitive yeah. for hiking. If it's like a, you know, a third, a fourth of their body weight or more, it makes it difficult. And so I think she was really, um, it's just clever and creative in taking what she needed yeah. to be successful out there. I'm wondering if in your research, like what one thing stood out to you of like just the most far out there, the most unconventional, you can't believe she packed that or did that or, you know, had this technique to hike down the trail. Like what stood out to you is just so out there about her style. Yeah. Well, there are two things. First, uh, she brought along a, a gingham dress uh, that she could shake out and put on to hike through towns. And she did this all the time. She would dip into the woods if she was approaching a trail town and change out of her. She normally, she hiked in, you know, men's dungarees and uh, a, a, ma a man's flannel shirt, but she would slip into the woods, take that off and change into this dress to hike through town so that uh, people didn't mistake her for a tramp. Cause she was after all a sort of genteel farm reared uh, woman. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is a shower curtain, yeah. which uh, fascinates me, you know? It rains so much on the AT. Um, just in my limited experience, God, <laughs> rain is so hard to deal with. 
and you wind up wet, everything is wet, all your gear is wet, uh, you know, your shoes are wet, et cetera. Um, the only thing she brought for rain protection, and she had no tent, no sleeping bag, nothing like that. The only thing that she brought for protection from the rain was that shower curtain. And it actually occurs to me that that might be a brilliant idea, like a shower curtain. The size of it is almost perfect for a tarp um, to get out of the rain. Uh, you know, and she, that, that first trip in 55, there were two hurricanes that blew in on her uh, and then raked up the eastern seaboard. So she was, it was an especially wet summer. She dealt with it with the shower curtain. That's, I've, I've not taken that, I've not taken that piece of gear out on, on, on the trail yet because obviously we've, uh, you know, we've advanced beyond the shower curtain, but it sort of makes sense to me that one might bring that along. Yeah. I love it. It's affordable, lightweight, packs down. Um, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. But, yeah. you know, one of the most kind of memorable scenes um, from the book and from her journey comes um, right before I think the first hurricane comes through. But she's made her, her way all the way up to Vermont and again had all these different social interactions along the way because like you said the trail was very different and went by more houses and through more towns back then more roads and she it seemed like mostly had positive responses from people some negative but she had this really amazing experience up in a shelter in Vermont with a group from New York City that just stands out as really a symbol of what the Appalachian Trail can be. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, I'm hoping if you can sort of describe that scene and that night for us. Yeah. So uh, the interesting thing about this for me is in her diary, she writes about this, but she, she, she basically says, um, and I, I hope all the people who are tuned in will forgive the uh, nomenclature of the day, but she, she writes that um, she came upon uh, uh, nine colored boys and two white um, priests from a Catholic parish in Harlem. And she writes that the boys were a little rowdy when she first walked upon them. Uh, they, they had been picking uh, unripe apples off a tree and throwing them at each other. And uh, it was kind of a, a bit of a scene. But Nevertheless, they offered her corn pone that they had cooked. Um, she sat down and spent some time with them. Uh, she decided the shelter was a little too crowded with 12, what would have been 12 people in it. And so she decided to press on. She makes it about another mile or two miles and comes to a, a creek that is at flood stage. It's impassable. And she decides she'd better go back and spend the night in the shelter with the boys. And so she returns there. And this is the summer of 1955. So, um, you know, we're months before Rosa Parks has, uh, I think it was that October that Rosa mm -hmm. Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education uh, came in 19, late 1954. So this is a period of like, you know, racial tension in America. Um, but anyhow, Emma Gatewood comes back uh, to the shelter occupied by these boys. And she, she calls them Catholic boys in her diary. Um, and she goes to bed that night. She said the only trouble was it was so packed that she had trouble falling asleep because this one boy kind of would throw his arm over her and she would have to move it off and he would throw it back over her. And, but eventually she found sleep. And then she writes uh, in her journal that she just, you know, the next morning she woke up and pressed on. Uh, I started trying to figure out who these boys were and doing some research. And I wound up talking, interestingly, coincidentally, to this, uh, to this guy who um, hikes back and forth across the country. And I forget his name. His first name is Steve. His son committed suicide. And so Steve tries to raise awareness for suicide by just walking back and back, back and forth across the country. And I, I, I uh, somehow happened to be in touch with him. And he said, you know what, I met somebody in Arizona who had a book that tells the rest of that story. Cause I was telling him about this. Yeah. And long story short, I got, I got information that this priest 
one of the priests who was there that day in 1955, who had since died, had left behind a self-published account of his life in the priesthood. And one chapter was dedicated to this experience on the AT. And he had written that in the summer of 1955, it was incredibly violent in Harlem, New York, where the parish to which he had been assigned. And uh, so violent, in fact, that the head of the church had appointed these two young parishioners to identify the head honchos of these two rival gangs that were warring it out in Harlem um, and invite them all on a, on a, a, a all expense paid trip to the Green Mountains of Vermont to try to broker the peace. And so these Catholic boys that Emma writes about in her journal were actually the, the head honchos of these two rival gangs from Harlem who'd been taken on this, on this uh, you know, backpacking trip into the Green Mountains of Vermont to try to solve whatever their beef was. That's who she bunked with that night. I think, I think it's so telling that, you know, nothing was amiss for her. She just, uh, she just um, slept the night with them. And then the next morning, uh, the priest wrote that, that they all sort of headed out together and they reached this, this stream that was impassable. And that Emma actually got on one of the backs of uh, one of the boys and he carried her across the creek. And I, I love that mental image of uh, her riding across this creek on, on the back of a strapping young man um, from Harlem. So yeah. that's the rest of the story. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I mean, it, it's so powerful. And just a testament to you never know who you will find on the AAT um, and, and a sense of community that forms so quickly and easily out there. And that's yeah. really from someone who's done the Appalachian Trail. I read um, Grandma Gatewood's account, which is so unique in so many ways and also so universal. Like some of the things she goes through, it's just such a, a, a genuine experience on the Appalachian Trail that now so many people have gone through and partly because of her. and. You know, she gets to the end of her, her first through hike and, and like you share, she she climbs Katahdin and, and sings America the Beautiful <laughs> on right. top, right. Um, which is awesome. But she, she doesn't stop there. And I'm wondering, and I'll encourage also, if you're um, joining us on Facebook, hello. Thanks for tuning in. If you're in the Zoom room and you have questions for Ben, Go ahead, type those questions in the Q&A button. We'll start getting to the audience questions. But I also, like we focus on this, this first journey that she completed because um, she did gain, you know, attention and she was 67 and, and she finished, but she didn't stop there. So what came next for Grandma Gatewood? Because what she did afterwards was just as impressive, if not more so. Yeah. Uh, it's true. So um, she took a year off, and then, uh, and then in uh, 1957, she wrote in her journal that she was sort of tired of her kids dumping her grandkids on her, um, <laughs> uh, and she she s took basically the same gear and the same route and went back to uh, uh, to Georgia. Um, this the the the. Southern Terminus had moved from Oglethorpe to Springer Mountain at that point, and she started at Springer and uh, hiked the whole thing again. Um, this time she had a much better time. The first time it was, it was tough, partly because of the hurricanes, but also because she didn't know, um, you know the, the trail culture, she didn't know what she was supposed to do. But in the intervening year, in 1956, she corresponded with everyone that she had met in that first hike. And so in 57, they all knew to expect her. She had written, you know, I'm on my way back through. So people were actually looking for her and they, uh, you know, invited her in and they were more likely to send her off with lunch or whatever for the next day. Um, the resupply was easier. Um, you know, and it, on that hike, she wrote that, uh, she laid down and took a nap in some grass uh, on, the, on the trail. And when she awoke, there were three buzzards standing shoulder to shoulder uh, right beside her. <laughs> and she said, I'm not dead yet. And of course they flew off. Um, 
she had a, a bunch of hilarious experiences like that. She was taking a nap on a moss covered log that extended kind of over the trail. And she, uh, she woke up and she looked to her right and there was a, a fox running down the trail with some prey in its mouth, a, a mouse or something. And uh, as soon as it got, it didn't even notice her. She's asleep on the log. And as soon as it got close, she said, well, you brought me my dinner. And the mouse, the, the fox dropped the mouse and ran off and she had dinner. <laughs> um, so there were a lot of uh, 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 sort of more fun experiences like that for her on the second trip. Uh, in 1959, she read that uh, in the newspaper that, um, that it was the centennial, the Oregon centennial, and that a wagon train had left Independence, Missouri on its way to Portland, Oregon, tracking the old uh, uh, Oregon Trail. And she thought, well, I've got nothing better to do. I might as well do that. And so she made her way to Independence, Missouri, overtook the wagon train in like two weeks and, uh, and blazed on to Portland. She arrived in Portland. There were, the newspapers had it, 5,000 people lining the streets, lining Burnside to uh, welcome her to town. Um, she was treated like royalty. She had a funny experience on, on that trip that I was never able to verify, but it's family lore. Uh, she checked into a, uh, or tried to check into a roadside motel and the proprietor of this motel uh, mistook her for a hobo and said, mm -hmm. we don't take your kind, <laughs> you know, in this motel. And she said, well, my kind, I'm Grandma Gatewood. You've not heard of me? And the guy says, well, no, I've not heard of you. And she says, well, I've got papers that prove that I'm an ambassador, uh, you know, an of official ambassador from the uh, Oregon Centennial. And she had been mailed papers from the governor of Oregon making her an ambassador. So she dipped into her bag. And as she did, somehow uh, marbles from her breast pocket spilled across the linoleum at this motel. And I, I, this is, sounds far-fetched to me, but it's family story. Uh, and they roll across and they, you know, uh, stop at the, the foot of the proprietor of this hotel. And he says, you know, he kind of gives her a look and she straightens up and she says, well, I guess, I, I guess I've lost my marbles. <laughs> uh, anyhow, she was treated like royalty. She made it onto the um, You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx, uh, which can be found online. I'm, I'm, I think um, she was taken up in a helicopter. She was invited by the local hiking club to hike Mount Hood. Um, she really uh, didn't enjoy that trip, but she enjoyed the celebrity that she got at the end of it. And then when she got back to Ohio, um, she started, um, uh, she'd been given an open-ended ticket by Greyhound bus lines. Yeah. And so she started trying to visit all 48 states. And in the midst of that, she started chipping off another section hike of the AT, which she finished in 1964, becoming the first person to ever hike the entirety of the AT three times. Yeah, I just, um, I mean, she has the retirement that one day I would love to have. And she says, a quote from your book is, she said, I don't want to sit and rock. I want to do something. And so not only does she hike the AT three times, she hiked the Oregon Trail from Missouri, Missouri to Portland. She took this bus trip, which is so phenomenal because she did, um, she did go to 48 states and three Canadian provinces. Yeah. And um, she also, if, if you visit Ohio, I mean, I feel like Grandma Gatewood is just such an important figure there. She's one of the founders of the Buckeye Trail, which is um, a loop trail that is in Ohio. Yeah. And also, um, she has a trail named after her at Hocking Hills State Park. Maybe it's a state park, but Hocking Hills. <laughs> And it's part of the Buckeye Trail. It's part of the North Country National Scenic Trail. And there's there's even a Grandma Gatewood Day there. And she trail maintained. She built trail into her 80s. Isn't that correct? It's correct. To be found working, you know, sun up to sundown, well into her 80s, trying to blaze trail through Gallia County, Ohio. And unfortunately, the Buckeye Trail doesn't follow the path that she blazed yeah. anymore. Um, I don't know why, but they skipped that path. But yeah, uh, she she was 
dedicated to the cause uh, right, right to the end. And the, I should say the Grandma Gatewood Trail in Hocking Hills, it is not a tough hike, but it's one of the most beautiful hikes mm -hmm. I've ever been on. It goes down into this canyon. Um, there are trees there left, juniper trees le left from uh, the last uh, retreat of the last ice age. Um, it is a, a phenomenal, there are caves and waterfalls. Uh, Backpacker Magazine mentions it time and again. But it's a wonderful six mile stretch of trail. And she led that winter hike right up until her death. Um, in fact, the last year that, that she uh, was able to uh, lead that hike, she couldn't complete the whole thing. And some men had to carry her, uh, the, you know, the, the trail that, over the trail that she didn't hike. Um, but she was, she, she said it was the uh, most beautiful six miles that she had ever seen, including all the hiking she did on the AT and all the hiking she did on the Oregon Trail. Yeah, I agree. If you don't think there's amazing trails in Ohio, then you have not been to Hocking Hills. It is, yeah. it is gorgeous. Um, so I'm going to get to some audience questions. One person wants to know they're interested in um, maybe researching uh, the book written by the priest that um, spent the night in the shelter with Grandma Gatewood. Do you know the name of that or where they might find that? Um, oh, goodness. So I think it is listed in the bibliography of Grandma Gatewood's Walk. I do not have it on the top of my head. And I'm sorry about that. Um, so another person asks, um, this person says, it'll be 59 next summer. So just like a spring chicken compared yeah. to Grandma Gatewood. And they said, I want to do it like Grandma. I don't know what that means, but what, what should they do? And this is, so this is a great piece of advice because yeah. Grandma Gatewood had, I mean, she, oh, I'm so sad. She did not live during the age of Twitter because she had these one liners that were like perfect, you know, like she had these punchy responses and one liners, but what advice do you think Grandma Gatewood would give, um, to us in modern day culture, to us as hikers, and even during the age of coronavirus. Like here's a woman who's so tough and so resilient. What do you think she would offer us in 2020? Hmm. Well, and she would have lived through the Spanish flu of 1918, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually don't know anything about how they dealt with that. Um, so, uh, you know, off the top of my head, she would have said, it's more heart than heal. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you, that's what her father always said. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, um, you do it. If you want to do it, you set out and do it. And that's, that's sort of my experience in hiking too. Like you, you know, there it's uncomfortable at times, but there, the rewards of the beauty of nature are, uh, so much better uh, over past the level of discomfort that you might have um by leaps and bounds um you know if you're really serious about doing it like grandma gatewood did then you'll sew yourself a denim drawstring sack <laughs> <laughs> you will pack inside of it you know one or two changes of clothes um a shower curtain uh a, a tin of band-aids some vic salve some powdered milk, some peanuts, some raisins, um, a, uh, a, boy, uh, a Swiss Army knife, uh, maybe a flashlight. I'm not encouraging this, by the way, because bad stuff happens to people on the trail. Um, but that's what she took. That's pretty much the extent of what she took, uh, an Army blanket uh, on top of that. She had no tent she had no fire starter she had uh you know she had no um uh sleeping bag she just packed stuff in a little bag and went and like found her way along the trail which is the incredible part of this story i spend god when we go i spend me and my kids I could spend a thousand bucks like buying gear and just, just for the prep side of it, you know, she did none of that. She, it was everything that she had, um, you know, 
hiked, hiked mostly in, in, in Keds or Canvas sneakers. Uh, and, you know, and she did have to rely on that, on the kindness and charity of people along the trail. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to do it like grandma, that's, that's a start right there. Yeah. Although I will say, I think there's Let me gonna... know. Cause I want to hear the story. <laughs> like I, think... I want to write the story for backpacker or something. If you decide to do it just like grandma Gatewood did, please be in touch. Uh, ben Montgomery writes at gmail.com. Oh man, you shouldn't have done that. That's going to blow <laughs> up. I think there's only going to be one grandma, you know, anyone else that comes now trying to do it just like her is, um, is an impersonator, like a, a historic interpreter. I think the important thing is to take lessons from her and then craft your own journey and your own path. Um, we have, Jen, a, Jen, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. So, on your super ultra lightweight uh, jaunts, yes. when you're going overnight, uh, multiple days, tell us what's in your backpack. Well, I think, you know, like Grandma Gatewood, I'm a minimalist. So even more than like shaving ounces, I just like to not take what I don't need. So I have a ultralight tarp or tent and a sleeping bag and a first aid kit. And that's one thing that has gotten heavier um, since the time I started. And then one pair of clothes with layers and, you know, my mom. one change of clothes? Yeah. I mean, yeah. some night clothes, like lightweight pajamas, but basically just one change of clothes. Um, I usually don't carry a stove with me for personal trips. It's just very minimal and very light. And, and gear, I feel like in so many ways has made it the trail more accessible and inclusive because it's gotten lighter. So this is the whole thing. Like for so long, and I have, I've had friends who through hiked in the 70s give me their lemur boots that weigh like 12 pounds, you know, and, you, and right. there's a thought that packs had to be 50 pounds and it's just really hard to carry that weight. Another thing I want to point out is Grandma Gatewood's hikes, both of them in her late 60s, she finished the Appalachian Trail with less resources than it has now in less than five months. Yeah. So now most hikers also take longer than she took to do her hike. So, you know, she really was such a trailblazer in so many ways, but not taking the things you don't need and cutting down weight allows you to experience more um, like she did. Yeah. So a few more questions here. One, um, <laughs> I'm gonna run a little interference because this one says, Ben, I read the book a couple of years back and wasn't thrilled with it. <gasps> My question is why include so much of the abuse and family issues she dealt with versus putting the focus on her journeys. And here's what I'm going to say to this. If you don't understand that what you experience off trail is a part of your long distance hike, then you haven't been on a long distance hike. And I know personally, when I share my journeys and something very personal comes up like faith or family or so much of the time now when I go on trail I think about my children and I talk about that and people are like keep the focus on the trail you don't really understand the experience of spending time in nature and the insight and how intimate it is until you bring up who you are as a person and I think it would be I'm gonna let Ben answer this because you asked Ben but I feel if you can't tell very strongly that Grandma Gatewood would not be who she is she would not have accomplished her journeys down the Appalachian Trail and the story would have huge holes if that part of her life had not been told but Ben you'll probably answer it better go ahead do you have anything to add to that yeah you, uh, you know I didn't want to make uh, I didn't want to make it all about uh, domestic violence, but this is uh, an effort at a biography of a serious hiker, and you can't ignore that. Um, the the uh, the reason she hiked, uh, which is the argument that I make in the book, uh, is because she spent thirty years married to an abusive, oppressive, hard-fisted man. Um, and you know it's not there's no there's no book without that yeah um, i i didn't dwell on it like like uh i didn't want it to come off as like violence porn so there are 
there are a handful of passages that deal with the domestic abuse. Um, so fair criticism, uh, but you're wrong. <laughs> uh, yes, but we appreciate, we appreciate your question. And, um, you know, we will take any type of question here and I appreciate Ben's answer and my interjecting, sorry about that, but oh, you get that too. It's our Zoom man. Of course. Um, okay, but another question related to that, which I am interested in, and and you do, when you go to the trail, I mean, a lot of people are out there hiking to be in nature and they're enjoying it. And then a lot of people are out there to heal. And the trail, we talk about nature therapy now, and there's all this science about how being outdoors is one of the most beneficial things for people who are going through hard times. For sure. Um, but one person asked, um, and, and you mentioned this briefly in the book about, you know, how Grandma Gatewood, she says she's widowed after she divorced, but her husband is still living for a long time. And one person is interested in when you did the interviews with her children, their perception of their father. Yeah. Um, so their, uh, you know, their father never abused them so far as I know he never took his rage out on his children uh, but they the four who were living it's down to two now uh, the four who were living when I interviewed them uh, remembered their father abusing their mother with regularity um, uh, they had traumatic terrible memories of that and it, it wasn't something they were ashamed to talk about given all the all the years that had passed um, sorry is that are you hearing that i'm hearing it yeah <laughs> oh cancel um so uh but but they thought it was as much a part of their mother's life as anything else so um you know they they all talked openly about about that abuse with me and uh you know it's an important again it's an important part of her story yeah i don't think she would have hiked the at had she not had she been comfortable at home and had she never been divorced like you know this was compulsion um as terrible as it was it was compulsion for her and it, it made her seek the, the refuge of nature and a lot of us do that you know we deal with difficult things in our lives and we have no escape except to go walk in the woods and uh this was true uh for emma gatewood yeah and you know one thing i picked up on in your book this time rereading it which if you've already reread if you've read the book once read it again. I mean, I got so much out of it going back to it a second time. And you had a phrase or a sentence in there that talked about her endurance, which ultimately the whole book is about her endurance. But in, in this phrase, it was the negative way she had endured so much with her, her marriage and her, you know, unhealthy relationship with her partner. And, um, even though it was so negative, it, it built the tools of endurance inside of her that then allowed her to be successful in a lot of things that she chose to do afterwards. And I think that really came out the second time reading the book is one thing that was so, you know, she gave all these trite answers to why she was hiking the AT for the heck of it, because it's there. But also the one you really key in on and, and that spoke to me, she wanted to do it. She finally got to choose her adventure and where she was going and the way she wanted to live her life. And, and that was so powerful in this book. Um, and such a great takeaway that, that life is hard, you know, life, life, no matter what you're doing, there's loss, there's tragedy. It's hard. Grandma Gatewood had an exceptionally hard life, but there are going to be moments or windows or times where hopefully you get to choose the direction that your life will go in. Yeah. And that, makes the hard so much more enjoyable yeah um she had she had sort of two phases you know she she had the, the domestic kid rearing phase and then she had a phase that was 
like you said, what I want my retirement to be like. <laughs> like, I just, I'm going to do what I want. That's, that's what she did. I'm going to do what I want. And, uh, you know, as difficult as we all perceive that to be, uh, it was for her an enjoyable thing. And it's so enjoyable that she just didn't stop. Like she, you know, did it three times in a row and then did the Oregon Trail. And um, there's no indication in anything that she's written that she didn't enjoy, enjoy it, you know? Yeah. She was critical of the trail the first time. Sports Illustrated, she said, oh, it's silly. Every, you know, you, an Indian would laugh at this trail goes down the deepest valleys and up the highest mountains. And, you know, she, she was, uh, she was critical, but at the same time, she, uh, she, she loved it. And her offspring do as well. They, you know, continue to support the AT and contribute in big ways to the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And, you know, as a result of their love, I do too, and my kids will as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's quite a legacy, and I think your book has expanded that and helped you know Grandma Gatewood's legacy grow and allow her to inspire more people to experience the trail and support the trail and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And so um, I just want to wrap up today because I feel like you know Emma introduced you from what you've said to the Appalachian Trail and this community and her stories and you've written such a beautiful book and are obviously such a talented writer and now so many of us are wondering um, what's next are you still writing do you have goals to do more hiking on the Appalachian Trail like what are your upcoming projects both personally and professionally thanks for that question uh, I am uh, I, I was hoping to go hike the uh, Tour du Mont Blanc uh, through fr Switzerland, France, and Italy uh, June 22nd, but it doesn't look like me and my kids are going to be able to do that. So we're going to reroute. Um, I think we, we might go to Alaska to do some hiking. This is all up in the air, unfortunately. Um, but uh, since Grandma Gatewood's Walk came out, I, I've written... Uh, three more books. Uh, this, the second was The Leper Spy, which is a story of a woman who um, helped the United States win World War II and happened to have leprosy. And that can be found on Amazon or at your local bookstore. Uh, the next was The Man Who Walked Backward, returning to the walking theme. And it tells the story of a, a Texan who in 1931 uh, set out to walk backward around the world and he made it from uh, He almost made it he made it from Abilene, Texas to Istanbul uh, And it uh, through the Great Depression and it tells uh, it tells his story, which is remarkable um, And then uh, I've got one coming January 2021 that's called a shot in the moonlight and it tells the story of a black man who was uh, a freed slave in southwestern Kentucky. And in 1897, 25 white men came to lynch him. And he defended himself by firing a gun out of his cabin. And he shot and killed the wealthiest, uh, the son, the, the scion of the wealthiest family in southwestern Kentucky. And that set in motion a whole crazy chain of events that wound up with him suing the mob eventually in federal court for burning his place down uh, and winning. And he did so with the help of a, uh, uh, a, a Confederate war hero turned uh, Southern lawyer. Um, so that comes out in 2021, A Shot in the Moonlight. Um, and that is, uh, that's been uh, what I'm working on. That's awesome. That's a lot. That's a lot of books to crank out and they all sound awesome. And I know you have a huge fan base within the trail community. So we'll be sure to pick some of those up um, and read some more that you put out and look for the new one. And if you're interested in uh, 
Grandma Gatewood's Walk, then again, I encourage you to look for it on Amazon at your local bookstore. Ben has been so kind. He's autographed a bunch of boxes of his book and has shipped them to Blue Ridge Hiking Company. So if you want an author signed copy, feel free to pick it up at our shop or order it online, which is www.blueridgehikingco.com. This is our pin ultimate armchair adventure book club. Um, next week, we're closing out with my latest title, which is The Pursuit of Endurance. And this is really cool. So one thing I learned in uh, Ben's book is that Grandma Gatewood, at least a few years ago, was one of only eight women, you said, who had hiked the Appalachian Trail three times, right? Uh, so next week, my special guest is going to, um, I think, she's on trail, but this is loosely confirmed. Heather Anderson, or Anish, has hiked the Appalachian Trail three times. I have hiked the Appalachian Trail three times. We've both hiked over 14,000 miles like Grandma Gatewood. And we're going to talk all things trail records, FKTs, our experiences, and share that with you to hopefully launch into a beautiful summer of adventures now that trails are starting to open up again. And if you didn't see it, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy put out some recommendations this week about how to enjoy the AT responsibly in your area if it is open. So be sure to check that out. Um, support, support your local public lands and trail conservancies and, um, and authors like Ben. There we go. There's Anisha's book, Thirst. That's great. And hey. we'll be talking about that as well next week. Let me, let me just, before you sign off, give a full-throated endorsement for uh, Pursuit of Endurance, uh, which is a, just a really great book and all the inspiration that you need. Um, so if you're listening to this, buy it immediately. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Awesome. Also, Grandma Gatewood bought a trailer after her third hike, which we have a trailer too as our bunkhouse. So <laughs> lots of similarities. Anyways, we're wrapping up today. Ben's got stuff to do. I hope everyone gets out to take a hike safely where trails are open and keep going. That's what Grandma Gatewood would do too. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Bye-bye.